Hello, welcome to the Finnish Football Show. Producer Mark can't be with us tonight. He's probably moonlighting with the uh, official SU Core podcast, but he'll be back. He'll be back with us soon, so don't panic. No matter, as I'm joined today by uh, Escape to Saw Me, Rich Nelson. Hello, Rich. Hello, how you doing? And FC Saw Me, Mark Hayton. Hello, Mark. Hey. Well, after a few weeks where it's um, been all about the Helmerit, we're back to talking about the men's national team as the Hukiat squad for the upcoming World Cup qualifiers was announced last week. We're going to have a chat for the squad and also look towards the Bosnia game that is coming up on Wednesday. But sadly tonight, there's only one place to start. Last week, during a Europa League game for Rangers, Hukiat midfield general Glenn Kamara was racially abused by a Slavia Prague player. During a break in play for a foul, the Czech player seemed to make a beeline straight for Kamara. He raised his hand to cover his mouth, and as he leant in to spoke to Glenn, he, um, he whispered or said something into his ear. Glenn was immediately incensed, and video footage that has since come out, he can be seen immediately pointing to the Czech player and could be heard to be shouting, racist, racist. Glenn Kamara released a statement the following day through his lawyer, and I think we can all agree that what was said to him is absolutely abhorrent. Um, Mark, Rich, what can you say about this? In, it's the year 2021 and um, these players are being subjected to this, this kind of abuse. What, what can we say? Yeah, um, well, I, I guess this is the issue we have a lot of the time in European competition. Um, I mean, unfortunately... You know, we're still talking about this is what happens when England play abroad. I mean, this, you know, for, for any argument's sake, is a very English-centric podcast, I suppose. But we, you know, we, we've all grown up in England, at least. And, you know, when England play away, it's quite a common thing. I think even last year or the year before, England went to Bulgaria and they almost postponed or cancelled the game because there's some racist chanting. And... Um, there is a massive grey area and it's caused some controversy as well because I think um, Slavia Prague have come out and said, we, you know, they're, they're, we're anti-racist, blah, blah. You know, they've, there's some suggestion they filed a complaint, of a, a criminal complaint with Police Scotland around, I think, an assault at some point that may have been against the player who's alleged to have said these against Glen Kamara. And... Um, and again, I mean, obviously Twitter's a cesspit at the best of times. And we, we've come away seeing um, the replies to Glenn Kamara. There was some graffiti in Helsinki that was very pro-Kamara. That's uh, some anti-Slavia sentiment as well. And you know, it's all got very nasty on, on social media anyway. But then, you know, some Slavia fans ended up holding big banners up with even worse things with their flares and everything um i mean it, it's also opened up the the issue around innocent until proven guilty but then in this day and age you've got to take the the victim statement seriously and if if glenn has heard these words then something has to be done about it so he's got to be investigated the only thing is is that i don't think many people have faith in uefa in actually doing much about it they pay lip service and every release these statements about respect and anti-racism but we all know that you're more likely to get fined for having the wrong logo on your pants than any racist slur or anything like that so unfortunately while I think most people believe what what Glenn says he's heard or what was said and we've even had tonight before the uh, the Hukiata training the squad have come out in t-shirts saying I stand with Glenn which is um you know, a nice gesture, but um, uh, the only problem is having faith in UEFA, which I have zero. So um, I, I do hope that they take this one seriously. It's um, It's been better documented than most similar circumstances. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, it's, it's the same. I think there's a lot of documentation. There was there was two incidents. So, so the first one is obviously the one on the pitch, the camera's caught. The referee for the tie then filed a, like an additional report about a scuffle in the tunnel after the match. Uh, where apparently Glenn went up to the kid and and may have laid fists on him. So that's where the kind of police report for assault comes from. That there was a bit of an altercation after the after the fact. But for me, I think there's two things about the incident itself. If you watch the if you watch the replay, when the kid 
uh, Kudel, Kudel, the, the Slavia Prague defender, when he goes over to uh, to talk to uh, Kamara, he goes over with uh, a pretty clear intent in his eyes, like he's going to go do some, do some, do something nasty, and then he covers his mouth for the cameras and for everybody else. And I mean, I think we've all been in matches where the heat of the moment kind of takes over you and, you and you swear or you fly off the handle at somebody, you never cover your mouth before that happens. So if you lose your rag, you lose your rag. This guy, he had it in the, like, he's, he's picked Glenn out of a, you know, out of a crowd. He's gone over specifically to him. He's covered his mouth. And it, uh, there's about, I think, two or three Rangers players that basically heard exactly the same thing that Glenn said verbatim. So I think there's no, there's no doubt that what he did or what what's happened here has been you know has been racial abuse that should be punished um but as rich says i think it's um it, it, it's a, it's now up to uefa to to try and do something and make an actual an actual um case out of this one because i think the other thing that st- stands out for me is glenn kamara is the kind of player who gets kicked up and down the pitch 90 minutes ev- twice a week every week and he, I've never seen him lose his rag or lose his cool. He gets, you know, he's, 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 that, he's that tenacious midfielder that gets sort of smashed all over the place. And whatever this kid said to him, he's just lost it. And um, I think those two things, the, 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 the actions and the attitude of the, of the defender, and then the reaction from Kamara, I think it's, it's, it's evidence enough that, that he's definitely crossed the line and he's done something really, really severe. I hope. I mean, I think that what I hope the most is that um, nothing happens to to Glenn after the tunnel reaction. So, uh, I mean, the, the, there's a uh, there's a big there's a big chance here that you know if if things go the way that UEFA usually handle them, this kid gets a slap on the wrist and Glenn has a you know five six game violent conduct match ban for reacting. And if that's the case, then they've lost the plot. It's just uh, yeah, it's 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 not good enough. Well, we we wait and see what what the result of that is, but um, I think I think we're all agreed. Like like you said, Mark Glenn Glenn's not the sort of guy to lose his cool in any situation, and um, for him to for him to be physically shaken like that, I don't think there's well certainly in my mind there's not a shadow of doubt that something extremely nasty has been said to him. And the other point is, why what what interest is there for well what reasoning is there for Glenn to lie? Why would he put himself up to to take more abuse, which is what's happened since the incident from people on his social media or other people all over all the other platforms. Why would he put himself up for that kind of kind of abuse if the initial thing never even happened? So anyway, the support that's come out of Finland and and Scotland and also the wider football world has, has been great to see. But the sad thing is, obviously, that this this even happened in the first place, and um, the fact that some some other fans have made this about club rivalry and it's just uh, you know it, it it beggars belief. But I think we're we're all on the same page when we say we hope that UEFA can can deal with this in the uh, in the toughest way possible. I mean, the thing is as well is that at the moment with the games having no fans in there, it's so much easier. For them, I mean, you can only imagine that what was said was possibly picked up on a microphone um, better than it would have been at a full Ibrox or whatever on a, on a normal match day. So, um, if they're that keen on looking into it, you know, this is the best chance they're ever going to have of getting that smoking gun. Um, I mean, it, like you said, the, the whole club rivalry, and the, the, unfortunately, this is the nature of football, isn't it? People will side with their club. People will side with. You know, it's a wider thing, but um, I think the main thing is that, you know, the vast majority of people are supportive of what Glenn said. What comes out as truth, we, we won't know, but I guess hopefully the truth will be outed and the right thing is done about it. That's the main thing. I mean, not only for us as uh, as Finland fans, but also for, for Glenn himself. I just hope that he's able to to move on from this, you know, realise that he doesn't have to carry this with him all the time and he can move on and start concentrating on his football again, you know? It's, it's, at the end of the day, it's not his problem. It's the problem of that, that check player and his, and his attitude. So um, hopefully we can, uh, we can all move on from that and, and Glenn can concentrate on his football and he, uh, he needs to concentrate quick because the, the games are coming thick and fast. There's, 
this coming Wednesday, Finland take on Bosnia Herzegovina at Helsinki Olympia Stadion, followed by an away game against Ukraine on Sunday. Sadly, the home game is behind closed doors due to the current COVID situation in the capital region in Finland. I'm sure the uh, SME Corps will have something planned, though, to let the, let the team know that we're all behind them and they have our support. Mark Rich, the squad was announced last week. We've seen call-ups for Carl Johan Eriksson in goals, Robert Ivanov in defence. What, um, what do you want to say about the uh, squad selection, guys? Yeah, I, I like it. It's it's good. I think so. It's good to see Ivanov. Ivanov said he had a great run from uh, at Honka. So he was he's Kakkonen, Utkonen, Veikkaus Liga, really impressive lad. Uh, he never really got his chance before he moved to Poland, and he's playing regularly in Poland now. So that's good. Good to see him. Hope he gets minutes. Uh, similar for for Eriksson at, at Mjalby. I think um, with the greatest respect to to uh, Ansi Arkola. I think it's it's you know there's a space opened up in the in the squad and it's nice to see somebody else kind of fill that third third keeper spot, uh, particularly somebody with a bit of a future. But for me, the best part is is Yola's back. Uh, Yola Bohian Palo is back. He's been getting. He's, I don't think he's yet played 90 minutes at Union Berlin, but um, but he's been playing an hour and then coming off the bench every now and again. So he's getting back fit and it's good to see him back back in the squad. Happy with it. Yeah, I think. Um... With the injuries that we knew about, obviously, uh, Fredetsky's out with his Achilles injury. Um, so, yes, so Joranen should be number one for at least the, the qualifiers. Be interesting to see who they put in goal for the, the Switzerland friendly. But, um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting. I think um, it's not, you know, Pukki's coming into this in just absolutely stellar form. I think it was 11 in nine before last weekend for Norwich. Um, and, yeah, you got... A lot of players in, in form, I think it's just a shame that there are those injuries on, on the fringes, as Mark mentioned. I think uh, Uren and he had COVID, didn't he? I think. Yeah, he's unavailable like, because of that, yeah. Long yeah. COVID as well, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously he'd, he'd have played if, if fit. Um, but I think that there's still that kind of, in the position behind the forwards, there's still that kind of excitement there. I think you've still got Robin Lodd, assuming he's match fit because the the way the, the MLS season works. Um, Taylor obviously did well. Valakari did at the when he came in in the autumn. And I think there is that excitement there. I think there are enough players there who can make a difference who aren't perhaps the ones that you naturally assume. I mean, you look at the starting 11 for the team, it's going to be quite standard. But I think there are a couple of wild cards there that, you know, in the right circumstance can change things. I mean, we saw in, in I think it was Bulgaria away, uh, Taylor and Lodd were crucial in that game, um, assisting Pukki. So I think it's it's decent. And um, I guess the only other sort of loss as well is uh, Frederick Jensen's injured again, which, um, you know, he's, his goals per minute ratio for the national team is, uh, is pretty special. And yet, <laughs> I don't know, has he ever played 90 minutes for the national team? I don't know. But, yeah. It's, um... Maybe in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, you we've hit the nail on the head there. I think, like, um, with the obvious in the, in injury to Rodetsky, to have Jesse Oronen coming in, um, I mean, he's been in absolutely outstanding form. Um, Brescia, unfortunately, succumbed to a 1 0, I think it was yesterday. But previous to that, he's had something like four or five clean sheets. And, um, mm. yeah, and he not just, not just, you know, standing there behind an Italian defence doing nothing, he's actually earned man of the match performances to, to keep those clean sheets for Brescia. So um, he's uh, he's absolutely on fire. So I don't think we've got any, any anything to worry about there. No, I mean, this, yeah, again, the issue, you know, is sort of embarrassment of riches to, to some degree. And, you know, Fredetsky's probably the outstanding individual player in that squad, you know, certainly playing at the highest level generally. And uh, that you've got a quality goalkeeper to come in and take his place. I mean, the last three or four seasons since Joranen's left Fulham. I mean, I, I mean, it's his birthday was it yesterday, the day before, he was 28 now. So, um, you know, it's, it's time he's, you know, he's proven himself. And even last season when they got relegated from Serie A, I think that who scored, who do everything by numbers because you don't play football on a pitch, you play on a spreadsheet. Um, he was voted or he got the most points over the season and was statistically the best goalkeeper, but probably because he had the most to do. But I think... Um, you know, you've got the, the, the main spine of 
Rive's sort of first 11 is pretty much there. Um, you've got the centre halves, you've got Car- um, Kamara, Sparv, even though Sparv's not exactly playing that regularly in Greece. Um, and there were some stories about him possibly leaving and going to Sweden, but he's come out and said that's, that's nonsense. But I think, you know, we're about as strong as you're going to get, really. I mean, you, you'll always, particularly this time of the season and, and this season as well, when the games are faster and quicker than and a bit more squashed in than they normally are. I think having the vast majority of your first choice squad available, it's probably the best Finland can hope for. One um, one pretty obvious omission was uh, young Ilmari Niska, and then he misses out. Um, he's been getting limited minutes in for his club in Germany. He, um, he obviously obviously left Finland, signed for Ingolstadt in in Germany with the you know the hope of um, setting setting that foreign league on fire. But he's been uh, the victim of what we've seen for from other Finnish players where they 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 move abroad and um, and then they're parked on the bench. I mean he's. He's got to be. He's got to be a bit, a bit gutted to to miss out, having made his way into the national setup. And as you were saying, Rich, you know, one of one of these players who who can excite, can push the ball past people, can be creative. Um, yeah, it's just. A, I guess it's it's just lack of minutes that's done for him. Mark, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at him and who, who, he might have been up for the same kind of spot as as Oni Valakari, right? Same, they had a, they had a pretty similar approach. I actually think Niskanen this time last year did probably better because he's a bit more versatile than Valakari. But Valakari came in and also had that absolute worldy against France. Um, and you think that Valakari's playing week in week out in uh, Cyprus? Is it Paphos? Yeah, Paphos. And and I think that's uh, it, that that's the thing that makes the difference. I think that the German third league, where um, when Niskanen's gone, I'm really worried for him. Really, really, I hate, I hate to see Finnish players go to that league because it's it's done in like like ruined Tim Vaurinen for for like for loads of years and Mika Oyala. Timo Furoholm had a decent sort of crack at it. He had a couple of seasons, but I think he also came back sort of just shy of thirty. So I'm really worried that uh, yeah I'm really worried about Niskan and he needs he needs games he needs to play yeah because I mean when he came in for the the that first Nations League double in September uh, I think he won man of the match in his first game and he was on fire for cups when they were doing well in the Europa League and and all of a sudden he's gone there I think he started okay but um, I did read a couple of articles in the last couple of weeks where it is just like. I think I'm not sure if they've got a new manager has come in and I think he's just not fancied him. And it's one of these where if you're settling into a new league, a new style of football, and if you're not on fire, and, and again, you know, just goes to show, like you said about Valakari, he's playing regularly, scoring a lot of goals. I mean, he's a, if you saw his goal at the weekend, it was lovely. I, I didn't realise Jason Punchin was still playing professional football, but um, <laughs> set him up for nice a nice assist. Nice assist for yeah, well, Valakari's goal. Yeah, well, but... Um, I mean, the thing is, I, I, I said in an interview recently, I mean, valakari has got so much potential and I think he's too good for Cyprus, but he's out there playing regularly, scoring goals. And to be honest, if he does that until the summer and gets in the Euro squad, that be days, you know, who's the fool? But I think it's a shame about Niskan and he looked like such a potential, you know, that kind of game changer potentially. And, and like so many, it's difficult to move from Vakehouse Liga unless you are that elite, elite player, which not many are, you go into, you know, German third division or some of them got a Belarus or something, Latvia, places like that, which are difficult at the best of times. So, yeah, it's well, a shame. I, I think the thing about, like, if you look at places like Cyprus, you get poached from Cyprus. So the Greek leagues and the Turkish leagues pick up players from Cyprus. Mm. No one picks players up from the German third division. Nobody goes looking there. Like, it's, it's there's just a, ah, okay, it's one of my... Frustrates me a lot when, when when Finnish players get stuck down there. So um, yeah, we we've touched on we've touched on where the goals are going to come from, and we've talked about Tamil Pukki being in absolutely fantastic form for uh, for Norwich City, banging in how many was it, Rich? Something like nine it's, and uh, seven. Or it's eleven in ten up till the weekend. So uh, wow. yeah, he didn't score on Saturday, but it was eleven in nine going into that. So you know, I mean, that, that's a fantastic return for anyone's money. But we um, we got a question from from Twitter today from uh, Kevin Mosley, and he said, um, "With Tim and Puki in such such fantastic form, is it a danger that Puki will become reliant on his goals? And should the 
should either those goals dry up or or Pukki, God forbid, suffer an injury, where would we look to for for those goals to be replaced? So I'm putting that one straight over to you two. You, you can answer that one for me. <laughs> well, it's funny because up until about three years ago, he wasn't consistently scoring anyway. So I think um, th- there is this thing where, you know, I... I love him you know and we're talking I think it's eight years ago today it was that go that game in Spain where he, he scored and it's difficult because at the time I always thought you know hold on hold on that game in Spain yes the, the miracle, miracle of, of Gijon. 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 um <laughs> where Mixu's jacket managed managed to hold together um this was uh, this is the thing where I think for a number of years up until he went to Norwich I think he did well he did quite well at Bromboo beforehand but he he always looked like he got into the positions but couldn't finish. Now, over the last, I think, three seasons in it or two and a half seasons in England, he scored 60 odd goals, I think, across the three seasons. And that's an age thing, that's a confidence thing, that's having that now so that he didn't have before because he always got into positions and missed. I think, again, you know, we're looking at what we've got as backup. Marcus Force completely untested but has so much potential Poe and Palo when he's not injured it's difficult because he's still showing it in bursts in sub appearances particularly in Germany uh, and you know I really like Frederick Jensen but unfortunately again he's injured which seems to be a, a recurring theme so I think on a on a kind of one-off if it was one game I think the guys generally are creating enough chances over 90 minutes um, like I said you know um, Kamara's been looking more attacking over the last year, 18 months as well. He, he's not sitting back anymore so much. Um, I think there's enough ammunition there. And I'm sure if, if Poe and Palo in particular was presented with an opportunity, I think he'd do quite well. I mean, that, that, that quality finisher is in there. But um, again, it just needs to kind of get, it, kind of get released. Yeah, both he and Force are, are clinical. And then you've got to think as well, Robin Ludd always chips in. You know, he's always got a goal or two sort of lying about, dropping in, coming in, arriving late from midfield. So you've got to think, I'd fancy Robin. So if Bucky, you know, has a little bit of a blip in the national team, I'm not, at the minute, not worried because, yeah, there's enough there's enough people in and around him to, to pick up goal. I mean, even Puru Soiri, he's he hasn't, uh, it's, been a, it's been a while when, since Puru, Puru scored, but uh, a year ago, two years ago, he was scoring every other game. So, yeah. and I think actually he got the, equal, was it against Bosnia when he got the equaliser last time out? Was it or was it? Oh, that might have been Croatia away. Anyway, so I think I think there's there's a lot of players in and around the squad who who can finish. Yeah, probably I mean, in the squad yeah. as well. So yeah, I, th- I think there's enough players there. I, I mean, I've sort of raved about Lod for years now. Um, I say, I just hope he's fit and and he can get in that in that team. But um, yeah, be. Hopefully, I think it was it after it was it, which game was it when I think after the Bulgaria game and Poli and Pala got injured. And I think we had that question and we were trying to work out who they play and they ended up playing one of the more attacking midfielders as a number 10 and it, it didn't really work. And I think they made a change and it worked better after that. So, yeah, thanks very much for your question, Kevin Mosley. Hopefully that's, um, that's answered it for you. I think um, we could all, all three of us could pretty much predict the, uh, the starting 11 for these, um, these World Cup qualifiers, but... After, after those very important games, we've got a, a friendly game away in Switzerland on Wednesday, the 31st of March. I mean, um, do we expect to see a bit of squad rotation for, for the friendly? Or do we think that River will stick to a more uh, more regular start in 11 to, to keep the boys match sharp? I'd be surprised if he played a strong team. I think we're at that point now where... And, and someone put the question to him at the squad announcement around, is he getting any pressure from club managers? Um, about you know the, the volume of games there are at the moment, particularly those who play in the more competitive leagues. I, I can't imagine uh, Norwich will want Tamer Pukki playing a third game in in seven days, especially if it's a friendly. Um, and I think as well, you know, we're at that point where you know we've already had two heavy internationals. It's a bit after the Lord Mayor's show. Uh, I, I'm sure some will come in because we need to look ahead you know we're thinking we're less than means it's as of today it's 82 83 days until the euro starts so um there are probably still some of the 23 places in the squad there's probably still two three maybe at a push that 
someone might make a late run for. And I think, you know, if, if someone comes in and has a blinder against Switzerland, that's the idea, I think. Yeah, I think the youngsters, they're not going to get that many minutes. I think Force and Valakari and the like, they probably gave gave Rive a bit of a headache with the France with the France win uh, at the end of last year. So I think he'll want to take a good look at those guys, a proper 90 minutes, a proper against against a team who, so Switzerland will be a really tricky opponent. They, they, they've got a, a fair amount of quality, but they're not like a, a world-class team. They're beatable. So it's not like you, like against France, we sort of sat back, picked our moments, hit on the break. We'll have to actually play a bit of football and uh, not rely on fantastic keeping and luck against the Swiss. Uh, so I think there's there's those guys. And then and then we have to be a bit honest. Tim Spav, Paolo Zarayuri, Yuani Oyala, can they do three games? I, I mean, they're the wrong side of 30 odd. So I think I think I think you know we've got we've got players in our in our midst who who just will be knackered by the time we get to that by the time we get to the Switzerland game. So I think um, even though even though our producer Mark's not here, I think we need to uh, stick with his favourite thing and say that's the uh, first half, don't we? You know, half time oranges out. <laughs> so yeah. Moving, um, moving swiftly on. We're uh, we're going to have a little chat about the Swarman Cup. That's um, getting into the uh, the business end of the competition. And um, Rich's team, Cooks, were absolutely on fire. When was it? Saturday or Sunday, Rich? Uh, it was Saturday. It turned out to be the only game in the quarterfinals that went ahead because um, the what can, what can I say? The the tournament that it is, and COVID. You know, that's that's the main reason. We're at the point now when we have. One team in the semi-final cups, they beat Nistan 5-1. It's quite a one-sided game, to be honest. But um, again, I think it's uh, it's what you expect. Cups, you know, probably top three teams against a team in the in the Ukanen division. Um, and now they're in the semi-final, but we're still waiting to see who, because they'll play the winner of Hoiko and either, not Hifke, or uh, Rops. Because <laughs> um, they've still got to play. I think that's that, that's happening this weekend. Then yeah. they've got to play, and then they've got to play, and there's it's the way. Unfortunately, this is the way it happens. But um, cups are in the semi final. That's the main thing. Um, the other half of the draw, you've got Inter against Asico in the other quarter final. That was delayed because of a COVID test in the Inter camp, and um, Honka against PK thirty five was also postponed. I think with about an hour's notice, because one team, and they didn't say who, and I haven't looked, um, had a COVID test. A positive test in the camp so unfortunately um yeah three of the quarterfinals haven't happened yet but um it's um i mean this this is the thing it's um it is a pre-season tournament and unfortunately the pre-season is going to last longer because last week they said the bakehouse liga kickoff is going to be delayed by two weeks for the teams that are in europe and then a further i think just over a week after that until the, the rest of the teams kick off so the teams in europe will play each other in the first round and they'll, they'll jig it around after that. But I, I think at the rate, the way things are in Finland at the moment, um, I, I can't see this season going off without a hitch. I mean, last year they did well to get 22 rounds in and lose the the final bits and bobs. They've, this, they're already coming out saying, no, no, we're keeping the structure. We're keeping everything as planned, but we know they did that last year as well and changed it as soon as Hoyko were mathematically certain of the title. No, not that bitter. <laughs> my favourite, uh, my favourite thing to come out of the Sullivan Cup this weekend was um, not Cooks's five-one win, but the uh, the picture you shared, Rich, of the uh, the Nistan fan there behind the fence because as the game was played behind closed doors, but he was brave in the snow and he had his flag up against the fence and was uh, yeah cheering on his cheering on his team from from behind the fence there. Well, it was an absolutely cracking photo that. I mean, that's the, that's the good thing about, especially Cups, their stadium is such a, it's a typical municipal stadium in Finland where it's, you know, it's not closed like the Bolt Arena, for example. It, you know, most of it's open. And I think they had that during the Europa League when one of the, which game was it? Uh, where they, uh, Sloven Bratislava, I think, where they scored in injury time to go through the next round. And even though the game was behind closed doors, there were hundreds of fans on the perimeter fencing with flares and it, they may as well have been in the stadium. Um, so, yeah, so I guess, you know, th things like that. I mean, we, we see 
all over Europe, you know, people being quite creative about how to, how they can watch the games. And I think in, in, um, Finn, and you know, the fact they drove, you know, it's a fair old drive up to Corpio in the snow in March. So, uh, yeah, fair play. Yeah, it was, it was good to see. It was good to see. Mark, like a um, bit of fan culture. Yeah. Mark, anything stand out from this weekend for you? Uh, Urho Nisila is, he's back. He's looking good. He looks, uh, I, th- I thought you had a, I thought you had a really good game. Uh, in the in the win against Nistan, I mean it's Nistan, which is uh, uh, you know lower what are the Ukkanen now I think, so not yeah. not the best. But I thought Oro did uh, did well. It was good good to see him back. Good to see him on the score sheet and uh, yeah, he's a good little player. I remember I I saw him play. When did I last see Coops at home? But six years ago, he came on and he looked like. Have you seen Zoolander, the film? <laughs> he looked a bit like Hansel, the the other male model. And he scored from a corner, like direct from a corner in this game. And it was like sitting there six years ago watching this guy. I think, bloody hell, here we go. And um, and again, he's another, he's um, made a couple of moves. I think he's come back from Belgium. Belgium. Was the last, yeah. Um, and yeah, he came back on loan last season. I think he's a permanent transfer now. So it's um, it's good to see him back. He's, he's one of these that are very much in that kind of grey area. Probably, probably too good for Veikhaus Liga, but... Yeah, well, there's there's not much better he's going to do, so it's good. And I think you know, Cups will do well. Um, and yeah, so again, the final was meant to be. I don't think they'd even put a date on it for this year, but we, we've got the ultimate prize of the UEFA Conference League awaiting the winners and a, a check for fifty thousand euros. <laughs> Lovely. But the, yeah, but the the women's cup they played all four quarterfinals at the weekend, so. Um, Maybe they're, they're doing something right, it seems. But um, yeah, we had, I think from, from that round, we had the holders, Orland United won, uh, Hoiko won, uh, I can't pronounce their name, Yupki, the, uh, from Yuviskula. Yeah, who, who that's qualified. got to be a fine. That has, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Yuviskula that's yeah. the one. Yeah. They're the team that qualified despite losing their two games by 15 nil, I think. Um, they also lost their quarterfinal 5-1. So at least they scored. But um, yeah, that competition is moving along nicely. So um, yeah, and the quarterfinals for that are looking quite tasty as well. Coops, Orland United and the PK35 against Oigo. 20,000 euros for that. Pretty much the uh, the usual suspects making it to the... Uh... So the, the, the business end of that competition again? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's generally around the, I mean, of, of those four, you'd imagine those four will certainly be in the top half of the table that, that league season. But uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, that one wasn't particularly seeded, but there's so many, there were so many group stages in that, but I think it's, uh, it's, you're not encouraging the lower league teams to get through, are you? So just um, going back to Bakehouse League quickly. So we've got um, Saturday... 24th of April for a, for a kickoff is is that correct? With um, yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that still the case? So that that's for the two matches of the teams that are playing in Europe this season. So they're going to get a week's head in. Well, in theory, they're going to get a week's head start on everyone else because they've got those European games to to look forward to. But um, yeah, so Hoiko Honka into against Coops uh, that weekend, assuming all goes well, which. Um, I mean, yeah. that's what, five weeks away. It's not going to happen. I'm sure something will, something will change. Yes, um, you know, we don't want to turn this into the uh, the finished COVID podcast, but yeah, <laughs> things seem to be things seem to be going a bit um, a bit downhill uh, uh, over there at the moment. I, I hope you're all right, Mark. Where you are? Yeah, yeah. You know, we're still it's we're in lockdown now, the second lockdown, and uh, it was what was it? Heath Oloma was the skiing winter holiday was two weeks ago. Yeah. So after that, everything went a bit nuts. So the the mm-hmm. cases went nuts, but uh, we'll be all right. We'll be all right. Good. So yeah, um, just uh, touching back on um, on hockey. Have we? Uh, have you had a look at the opposition at all, Mark? I mean, um, I was reading today somewhere that. Uh, Zeko is a bit of a doubt for the Bosnia game, but have you had a detailed look at either Bosnia or Ukraine? Uh, yeah, well, look, I look, I was looking at Bosnia. I mean, I, I'd quite hope Zeko actually starts because he's 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 not scoring in uh, in Serie A. He's playing for he's playing every game for Roma, and he's not scored. He's he scored a couple in the uh, in the Europa League, but he's not scored. Uh, I think this this year, so since this, since the turn of the year for Roma, 
Uh, they played on Sunday and got turned over by Napoli, uh, pretty easy. And I think for for Bosnia themselves, they haven't won in I think five or six games. So we, we're picking them up on a pretty good time to to play them. Uh, I, I'm I'm quite yeah. I'm, I don't want to. I never I never I never get too bullish, you know, around 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 games like Bosnia, but but they look like they're in it. They're in a you know, this is a good time to play them. They haven't, yeah, they've won, I think they've only won one since, one in the last 10. So, and that was against Liechtenstein. So I think this is, uh, fingers crossed. Our old mates, Liechtenstein. I, um, I, obviously we played, we played a, a, a double header against Bosnia in the, um, in the previous campaign. And uh, what was the, the, the home game was absolutely immense, wasn't it? But my, uh, my biggest memory is obviously being in, Sarajevo for the um, the away game where we got done four one, but um, fas- yeah, absolutely fantastic trip. Just the uh, unfortunately the result didn't quite didn't quite live up to it. But I think you're right. It's um, you know they're they're that team that are around around our level these days. I would have said so. Um, yeah, we were we I think I think we can be quite hopeful, especially as we're we're at home, obviously without the crowd, but. Um, but yeah, home advantage still. The boys have um, obviously the, the the foreign base players have had to travel to to Helsinki. But yeah, not too much too much travelling to worry about. So um, yeah, we'll see see how we get on. Have you had a look at Ukraine at all? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think well, I mean that game got moved, didn't it? I think it was meant to be in Lviv at first, and it's moved to Kiev for COVID reasons. Yeah. So um, again, that that's still going on. But um, I mean, going back to Bosnia, you're saying about how how close the teams are. I mean, that was the team that Finland pipped to get the the senior World Cup seeding. I think the difference in the FIFA ranking between the two clubs is about a fag packet, or probably Finland one more one more throw in in the Nations League or something like that. But <laughs> it's um, I mean, you you think this is. With the with only one team qualifying as by right from the group, and the world champions are in the same group, um, it, it's going to be really tricky. And I think uh, if if Finland can get off to a good start, uh, Bosnia at home and, and then Ukraine away. Um, hopefully, by the time France visit in the final group game, Finland's qualification will be secure, and uh, we're going to have a big party on a Monday night at the time nine forty five pm local time kick off. Thank you, Afa. But. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting setup this time of the World Cup, but um, yeah, it's uh, they're, they're thick and fast, and like we, I think we discussed. I'm not sure if it confirmed at the time. Um, after these three games, we've also got Sweden and Estonia at the end of May, start of June, uh, as well. So um, yeah, this is going to be probably the most Finland senior games in one year, I'd imagine by the end of it. Hope, and hopefully there'll be seven in the summer, not just three. Yeah, yeah and um, and hopefully we we'll, might be able to get to them wherever. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's next month, isn't it, that UEFA are going to finally let us know exactly what's happening? Yeah, start of April. Yeah, they've. Um, I think the the latest. I mean, again, try not to get too bogged down in gossip and stuff. There's a lot of suggestion that the UEFA. I I think they're still keen to have it in as many places as possible, but they want it in stadiums where there'll be at least a decent attendance. I don't think they're going to expect a hundred percent, but I think they're looking at they want stadiums with a good sort of forty fifty percent capacity. And some nope. countries that's not going to happen. There was a yeah, there was a statement. It wasn't Infantino. It was one of his one of his underlings. But they said that if you're a host city, you have to have fans. Yeah. Like if you if you're hosting games, you like you have to have you have to be able to guarantee a certain number of fans into the squad. So I think uh, that's I don't know where that's going to leave like Russia and and some some of the other some of the other places that uh, where the, where the tracking for COVID isn't isn't exactly um, top notch. But let's see, let's see. Yeah, because I mean, the Olympics last week, they confirmed they're not having any foreign yeah. travel in for that. And I guess, I mean, that's what, six weeks or so after the Euros? Mm. Not even that, probably. So I think that's that's very much seen as that. So I think if uh, the likelihood is that you probably have to be a resident in that country or city to go in. And I think that's going to rule out a lot. There'll be a lot of people. Mm. And I can't imagine of those 12 cities, 
I can't see all 12 of those being able to to get a categorically promise that they'll be able to let people in. Yeah, well, we uh, we can't really second guess. We just have to wait and see what those uh, masterminds that you have come up with. But yeah, we'll um, obviously let everyone know as soon as we do. But yeah, just they'd like to sponsor this. the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you would like to sponsor the Finnish football show, just get in touch, not a problem. But, um, yeah, just looking at those fixtures, obviously Wednesday's the Bosnia game. What have we got for a kickoff there? Is that a, is that a 1945? Yeah. Yeah, quite. So down. 1945 UK time, is that right? And then uh, a bit later yeah. for you, Mark. Yeah, quarter to 10, family time. Yes. And, and then... Um, and then on Sunday, it's uh, 19.45 UK time, so quarter to 10 again in Finland for, for the Ukraine game. But Sunday's quite a, quite an interesting day, actually, because um, you've got in the WSL, so Women's English Super League, you've got Brighton and Hove Albion versus Everton, which could see um, three Helmerit in action. And, um, and then you've got, just after that, you've got Juventus versus Pink Bari with our mate Paola Muloya. And... Um, Tarja Hurinen, who plays for uh, Juventus. So, um, yeah, quite a quite an interesting day for um, Finland fans next Sunday. So, um, yeah, that would be me on the sofa all day. <laughs> well, Finland women are playing Austria in a friendly next month. And that got announced the other day. So, uh, obviously, there's a fair while until uh, Euro 2022. But they are announcing the World Cup qualifying groups at the end of April. So, uh Again, another qualification. I think the next Women's World Cup is in Australia, I believe. Australia, New Zealand, possibly. So um, if Finland can can get a good momentum going into that, that'll be very interesting. And I think they've got a few more places as well, the way that that is now a 32-team tournament. Or is it now a 24-team? I can't remember. Um, but they've expanded it anyway. So Europe are getting an extra place and then an extra... I mean, typical fee for UEFA, they're making that the most... I mean, we can talk about that nearer the time, but the, the most convoluted playoff system known to man. I think the next World Cup one for the men's looks like a doddle in comparison. Um, but yeah, they've... Anything to get a couple more votes at the next FIFA Congress, I think. <laughs> oh, dear. So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wait and see what, what comes of that. But um, when, when's that being announced then, Rich? The, the, um, the qualifier? So that groups are being done on the 30th of April for the World Cup qualifying. Um, I don't know when they're doing the groups for Euro 2022. I can't imagine that'll be for a number of months yet. I think they've, they've still got playoffs to play as well. But um, I, I mean, to be honest, normally when, when you look at a men's tournament or, or a big tournament, they're probably six, seven, eight months in advance. So I reckon we'll probably wait till the autumn for that. Nice. So... Um... Yeah, time for me to uh, put you guys on the spot now. I want a prediction for, for Wednesday's game, please. A score prediction. I'll do a Mr. T from Rocky and just say pain. Um, I, I honestly think um, Finland at home to Bosnia is probably one of the the most achievable results. Of, I, th I think Finland win that 2-1. Yeah. yeah, same thing. I think it'd be low score. Warren, uh, I'd have gone gone with something similar. Let's say let's say two nil. Yes, a Yoren and blinder, and then a, and then a pookie brace. Nice one. Well, as um, as I'm hosting this week, I get to answer the questions, which means I don't have to embarrass myself with a prediction. <laughs> no, 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 no. Come on, you've got All to right. put it down. Right. Okay. So I mean, I was I was going to go I was going to go two one as well, but. I actually, I actually like yours, Mark, with the with the Jesse Joranen absolute blinder of a game. So I'm going to say two 0 as well. There we go. Puki, Puki, one goal, and then Yole Poy and Palo to come back and smash in a, a smash in one in the second half for two 0 Yeah, get more specific now, aren't we? We're going to have to start putting money on these things, like the first throw in and things like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so um, yeah, if there's a uh, there's Nothing else we want to discuss, boys. I think we're we're getting close to the full time. It's uh, anything else you want to bring to the table? No, I think um, we've got three three games in a week to look forward to. I mean, I, I'll be honest; I'll probably have some fatigue by the time the Switzerland one comes around. But um, it's nice. I think this having competitive games to build up to the Euros is um, 
oh, I know it's kind of a, a fault. It wasn't meant to happen this way, but I think it's a cracking, cracking little build up. I think, um, you know, there, there's always a bit more of a buzz around the competitive games. And um, yeah, I'm look, looking forward to it. Mark? Yeah, same here, same here. I, I really want to see, I really, I really want to see the youngsters maybe get on and get some minutes, see if we can get some some of the young lads a bit of, uh, a bit, a bit of good competition going on before the big tournament. So yeah, looking forward to it. I mean, it's um, I, I'm exactly the same. I, I love sitting at sitting at work listening to all the uh, all the Premier League fans bemoan the international break, <laughs> and they can see me rubbing my hands together and getting all excited. And they're like, "What's the matter with you?" But you know, when you're a, when you're a Finland fan, this is what it's all about. It's nice to see the, the games coming up, and uh, and as you say, boys, p- competitive fixtures, so that we're we're out there out there pushing it and see see where we can get to this time. So I think, um, yeah, unfortunately, we, uh, as you may, well, well-tuned listeners of the podcast may have realised that we haven't done a Yassir Lesipoli today. So un- unless unless Mark Hayton's got something off the cuff, um, that's that that's uh, that's due to the fact that our our producer Mark's not with us, and so all the structure's gone out of winter. <laughs> He's left it to us. That'll yes, teach him. Yeah. That'll teach like, him. Yeah. Lunatics in charge of the asylum. <laughs> well, I suppose, yeah, the, the, the lads the, the lads I play with often tell me I've got a, a Shefki in Kosketus, which is uh, the touch, a Shefki touch, oh, <laughs> which, is, nice. which is the kind of trap in a ball where it obviously it, it goes like five five feet in front of you after you try to cushion it. So, You've got a touch like Shefki. There touch we go. Like, touch like Shefki. There you go. And that's a swan yes. dive to celebrate. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, celebrate like Shefty as well. Yeah. Well, I think that all that remains to say then is don't forget to follow us across our social media channels. On Twitter, Mark, you are? Uh, FC Swarmy. And Rich, on Twitter, you are? Escape to Swarmy. And you can, if you're inclined, you can follow me on Twitter, <laughs> at Keke Um uh, Don't forget you can subscribe to the Finnish Football Show YouTube channel for videos of all our previous episodes and, and interviews. There's some really great stuff over there. Our um, our latest interview with uh, Helmerit and Pinkbury goalkeeper Paula Muluoya is definitely worth watching. Um, I think she you was, guys will agree. She it's was great. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So um, if you haven't if you haven't checked that out yet, it's um should have dropped into your preferred podcast player or go over to the YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Um, Thanks to our latest YouTube subscribers, Michael Bailey, Hugo Mackey, and Ridwan Bozic. Follow our Instagram page at finish underscore football underscore show for photo updates. And thanks to Jonas Lutikainen, who became our 300th follower over there. And also make sure you check out our website, finishfootballshow.com. We've got another Helmerit interview coming out in the next uh, few days or or within the week I should say so keep your eyes peeled for that one that will drop into your podcast player and will also be available on YouTube myself and uh, Mark Hayton there spoke to one of the Helmerit we'll um, give you a clue a bit later as who it might be but yeah she's playing against Everton ladies in a, on Sunday so there you go and it's one not Nora one. yeah and it's not Nora <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah work it out so yeah that should be with you soon but yeah thanks for joining us and um, we'll speak to you soon so Rich Moika yeah. Mark hey yeah. cheers goodbye do 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 do